Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So we have been discussing about Mendelian genetics and we have seen many examples in which way understanding the genetic laws can really help us to do lot of genetic testing. In the same light I think it is important for us to learn how new modern biotechnology tools have started making huge difference in day to day medical applications. You have just seen one video where you may have realized that in which way personalized medicine is not any more efficient. If you understand uh, an individual's genome variation, what kind of mutation might be happening in this particular individual, so then you can give some medicine which are very much uh, re, uh, could be recognized by the receptors of those mutations and then it will be much more effective for that individual as compared to you are just giving some generic drugs to every individual and therefore many times for a given treatment you may realize that you have a lot of side effects. And those side effects are just result of us be not knowing this exact way of modality of the treatment. So in molecular basis of inheritance we had discussed about some of the classical experiments uh, and then I will talk to you about some more classical experiment in which way some of the fundamentals that what is the genetic material is the DNA or the proteins were established and similarly many of the transforming principles as well as how DNA replicates those kind of laws were how they were derived we are going to discuss about those experiments can a genetic trait be transferred in two bacterial strains there are two strains one is having capsule with S strain one is not having capsule R strain the, the one which is having S strain will may cause pneumonia other one is not going to cause pneumonia and this experiment was done by Griffith where he proved the principle of transformation. So we had seen the first condition that if you have S capsule which you are now injecting in the mouse, mouse dies because of the virulence from the capsule. If you have living R cell they are non pathogenic they will not have any impact so mouse remain healthy. If you are having the heat killed S cells it means you are killing the capsule layer then that makes it non pathogenic and again mouse will remain healthy. If you have last situation like this when you are adding a mixture of heat killed S cells and you are adding the living R cells what was the phenotype for the mouse? Mouse died and that was because of what happened in this experiment in the last one? And how that happened? So, in which way R cell acquired the S cell characteristics? So, in this case, probably some material, some DNA from the S cell got transferred to the R cell and made them pathogenic. And this is what resulted into this phenotype, which was mouse died. So, uh, what Griffith then concluded from the experiment that if we are injecting both non pathogenic and pathogenic but there is some kind of transformation is happening some substance is moving from the uh, S cells to the R cell and that is giving it the property which is making it much more uh, pathogenic and creating the mouse to die. So this is kind of conclusion from the uh, this experiment. So the living R bacteria uh, got some substance from the uh, heat killed S cells which is like a transformation is happening in this particular type of bacteria and therefore this particular uh, phenotype was observed which is not so much common which was not expected and that is where he first time realized there might be some material could be transformed and that resulted into Griffith's transforming principle or the factors which are known as the DNA are the transforming factors. So now let us come to the next question which we started discussing briefly uh, is protein or DNA the genetic material and now who will explain the, this experiment. 
So we have been saying, you know, all the genetics based on DNA, that DNA is going to transfer from one to next generation, right? But why by default we assume that DNA is the only thing which is going to have the, those uh, properties which is going to get transmitted from one to next generation. It might be even protein may have the same property. So somebody would have done it first time and thought about this type of experiment, right? And these are the two scientists, Hershey and Chase. If you remember, we, we discussed briefly that one could use some sort of labels to find out or the track these kind of molecules. In 1930s, 50s, that time, most of the experiments were done very elegantly just by using some very basic reagents and the labeling strategies and looking at things in the radioactivity. So if you know that you, know, you can label DNA because you have the phosphorus backbone in the DNA with the 32 phosphorus, you can label DNA. Or you can label protein with some, some methionine, residues are, are there in amino acids. With the sulfur, you can label proteins. So you, they use that property. And let, let's kind of look, look briefly. So just imagine they used one of the uh, bacterial strain. And now there is a, a virus, which is phage. A phage, which is, uh, if it can uh, eat bacteria, that is bacteriophage. So now it is this particular virus is there. So virus for its propagation transfers some genetic material to the bacteria. And, and therefore then it can have its multiple property. It can propagate in bacteria and make multiple copies of its own, right? So what they're thinking, can we label both the DNA of it, if there is some DNA component of virus, or even the protein, if we are labeling both of them, and now let's see what is going inside the bacteria, which is going to create multiplication. So that will be probably one which is going to have all the genetic information, so that one could then extrapolate information from it, whether the DNA or the protein have the genetic information. So to do this experiment, they use a very simple technique, analytical instrument, which is known as centrifuge. In centrifuge, I'm sure you have seen washing machines. So it's something like washing machine, where you are using a very high centrifugal force. And let's say you have, uh, these are the rotors in which you are keeping the tubes. So let's say one of the tube is kept here. And when you are using very high centrifuge, centrifugal speed here, let's say, you know, 10,000 uh, RPM, etc. So then based on this particular speed, if you have this tube here, whatever the bacterial membrane and the contents are there, they will just come as a part of the bottom part, which is, will be pellet. And anything which, which is liquid, clear part, that will remain as supernatant. So if whatever is going inside the bacteria, along with bacterial membrane and debris, it will come inside which will become part of the pellet, and anything which remains out will become part of the supernatant. That was his assumption, and he had labeled both protein and DNA, so he was trying to see from radioactivity what is going inside the pellet and what is going in the supernatant part. When he did this particular labeling experiment, what he found that in the pellet, he could see radioactivity of the DNA. So based on this information, and whereas the protein was found in the supernatant part, so looking at this information, he was able to conclude that the DNA is going inside the bacteria from the phage, whereas the protein remains outside, it's not entering inside the bacteria, and therefore protein he can see in the supernatant part, and DNA is coming in the pellet part. Just by doing the simple labeling experiment, he was able to conclude that the phage DNA entered the bacterial cells, but phage proteins did not. So these were some very classical you know, experiment done in 1900, uh, that century. Uh, which has resulted into a lot of fundamental information. And if you think about it, I think these are not so difficult thing to do. You know, just need some sort of concepts to be tried out. Uh, I'm sure we have studied about chemical composition of DNA. You have been taught uh, looking at two DNA strand double helix model of DNA. Uh, Watson and Crick, these are the scientists who elucidated the structure of DNA and they got Nobel Prize for it. Very briefly, you have uh, you know, AT and GC base pairs, whenever you have A, you will have the T with the two hydrogen bonds, and G with the C3 triple hydrogen bonds. 
So this kind of pairing will be there, complementary base pairing will be there. And now whenever uh, a scientist actually, uh, Erwin Chargaff, he derived the rule that uh, percentage of A base pair will be equal to percentage of T base pairs, whereas percentage of G base pair will be equal to percentage of C base pairs. So some of these are the basic information linked to the DNA. Now let's think about one of the property of DNA which was DNA replication. Let's think about how DNA replication happens. So it, you are making multiple copies of DNA happening inside the cell. DNA is double stranded. So people have proposed multiple hypotheses. What are the possible ways in which DNA replication may happen? And there were, have been three hypotheses proposed. Dispersive, semi-conservative and conservative. Semi-conservative has the most popular hypothesis. So let's look at this slightly in detail. If you have this DNA, let's say dark blue colored ones, both double helix. Now in the first replication after that, you can see one of the dark blue remain there and one of the new light chain, new light form has appeared. And now in the second generation, one of the dark form and the light form remains there and again light forms, again is synthesized which makes it again double helix. This is kind of DNA semi-conservative replication. The conservative replication is based on that one uh, DNA is always going to be like the original parental DNA even in the after the first and the second replication. And the dispersive model says a mixture of both the, the strands of the DNA will be se keep segregating after first replication and the second replication. So again these are the hypotheses. Now uh, people were kind of puzzled that what is the way of DNA replication to happen. And a scientist, uh, a group of scientists in fact, Misselson and Stahl, they did a, a very nice experiment and tried to prove in which way DNA replication may happen. All right, so let's assume that we have uh, this DNA in the parental strand. And both of them are N15 labeled. After the first generation, one of the strand from the parental one remains there and a new form which is from the light. So this is N15. One strand comes from N15 and one newly synthesized N14. Now from this one, we have one of the blue one and one of the white. And from this again, All right, and same will happen here as well, right, from this part. Okay, so now let's think about the percentage of how much we have heavy form here in the uh, parental one for N15. So that is 100%, right? Now, if I have grown N15 DNA in a medium which is light medium N14 medium, now the second strand of DNA is N14. What is the ratio here for the hybrid? This is hybrid. It is hybrid means it is having both N14 and N15 mixture of that, right? So in this particular one, in the first, after first replication, everything becomes hybrid, 100% hybrid forms here. Now as it goes to the second replication, how much is hybrid and how much is the N14? This is hybrid, right? This is hybrid. So this is, these two are, as well as these two, these are part of the second replication. So what is the percentage of hybrid and percentage of N14? 50-50, right? So there are ways of doing the density centrifugation where you can separate these based on the density. They use cesium chloride based density uh, to separate these particular bands, light or heavy form of the band. And this is how the experiment was being done. So initially they grown bacteria in N15 or the heavy isotopic forms. Then they transferred that to the light form or the N14 medium. And now from there they can see the bands 
you know, is that coming in the center or there are some new band appearing which are less dense than that? And when they analyze those particular fractions, then they are able to conclude what is the ratio of N15, what is the ratio of N14 and N15, and what is the from one to next generation, how much percentage they can see the change. So if you see in this particular experiment here, in the hybrid band, which is having both 100% after the first replication, and after second replication, you have 50% of the hybrid band and 50% of the light band appearing. Now, if you go to the next generation, what will happen? Please draw. Twenty-five, seventy-five. Somebody mentioned rightly. All right. So this is pretty much, uh, you know, a way for them to prove that among the three models uh, which are known, uh, dispersive model, semi-conservative, and conservative, probably the DNA ha replication happens using semi-conservative model. And just by growing DNA from N15 and N14 medium and analyzing the DNA contents, they were able to make this conclusion. Let me explain you this in more detail in the uh, following animation. According to the conservative model, the two parental strands of DNA as a whole serve as a template for the synthesis of progeny DNA molecules. Thus, one of the daughter DNA molecules is actually the parental DNA, while the other daughter DNA consists of two newly synthesized strands from fresh nucleotides. The dispersive model of DNA replication hypothesizes that the parental DNA molecule is cleaved into smaller double-stranded DNA segments which serve as a template for synthesis of new DNA strands. The segments then reassemble into completed DNA double helices with parental and daughter DNA segments interspersed. The content of parental DNA in the double helix goes on decreasing with each generation. According to the semi-conservative model of replication, each parental strand acts as a template for the synthesis of a new strand of DNA which is complementary to the parental strand. Each daughter DNA molecule always has one parental DNA strand and one newly synthesized daughter strand. Of the three replication models suggested, Messelson and Stahl proved that the semi-conservative model was correct. For this, they grew E. coli cultures for several generations in N15 containing medium so that the bases in DNA contained N15 instead of N14. Next, they transferred and grew the cultures for several generations in an N14 containing medium. Throughout the period of growth, samples were taken, cells lysed, and the DNA analyzed by centrifugation in CSCL gradient. The parent DNA showed one band in CSCL gradient corresponding to N15 DNA. The first generation daughter molecules also showed one band which was not at the same position as parent DNA. This corresponded to N14, N15 DNA, while the second generation showed two bands, one of N14, N15, and the other of N14 light DNA. These results exactly matched the semi-conservative replication model. So this brings to the end of this entire uh, section on genetics. Uh, you are now familiar with 
Mendelian loss based on Mendel's experiment on the classical pea plant. You now also know how uh, Morgan independently tested uh, Mendel's observation, Mendel's experiment using another model system which was Drosophila melanogaster or the fruit fly, which provided evidences that the chromosomes are indeed the location of Mendel's heritable factors. Then we have discussed about the classical genetic experiment, which proved that the DNA is the heritable factor and it is transferred across generations. You are also introduced to the concepts of genetic recombination and linkage between genes and how it affects the inheritance of characters. We then discussed about few chromosomal abnormalities and looked at you know various examples and syndromes, how alteration of chromosome numbers uh, and even structure could cause some of the genetic disorders. In the next lecture, we will start about you know a new topic, uh, thinking about the bacteria and other prokaryotes. Uh, and then we will talk about some of the applications uh, you know, which are linked to those microorganisms. Thank you. Mm -hmm.